So it's my pleasure to introduce a young lady today uh, who I've known for a very long time and she's making me feel really old. She's, a, she's grown up now, but I've known her for a very long time. And that's Malaika Vaz. Uh, for people who have been used to watching the wildlife documentaries, etc., I don't think she's a new face or a new name. But at an age when most children are still hiding behind their mother's saris, Malaika was already an awesome exception. So when she was really young, like I'm saying around 14, she went on expeditions to the Arctic and Antarctic, not to mention many other ecologically sensitive places because she's always been very keen on wildlife and conservation. At 18, she did her first film project on tigers of central India. Malaika is now a National Geographic explorer, TV presenter, and wildlife filmmaker who works on documentaries focused on the environment for networks like Nat Geo, Wild Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, and Al Jazeera. She is the co-founder of Untamed Planet, a film production house aimed at bringing conservation programming into mainstream television globally and recently created a three-part TV series on the community-led conservation of Asiatic lions, leopards, and tigers, titled Living with Predators, which is airing on Nat Geo Wild and Disney Plus. Passionate about investigating transnational wildlife crime, she has been documenting the illegal trade in lesser-known wildlife contraband across Southeast Asia. Over the past few months, her film, Refugees at Home, has documented the impact of the pandemic on vulnerable migrant workers in India through National Geographic's COVID-19 Emergency Fund for journalists. Currently, she's reporting on bat conservation and wildlife trade in a post-COVID world for Al Jazeera's award-winning environmental solutions program, Earth Rise. I had the pleasure of reconnecting with her after many, many years at the Whale Shark Con Convention hosted by Wildlife Trust of India in Ahmedabad a couple of years ago. And at which time I had no idea that I would have the pleasure and honor of hosting her for this webinar. So Malaika, welcome. Great to have you here. It took a bit of arm twisting, but I finally managed to get you here. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I'm sure the audience would love to hear me stop talking and to hear your dulcet tones about all the exploits that you've been up to. And so I'm going to hand over the floor to you. After this, please hold your questions so that you can ask her right at the end of the presentation. Thanks, Malaika. You're on. All right. Thank you so much, Venkat. And it's such a pleasure to be here today. I went diving with you, I think, about 12 years back and ever since then I've been fascinated by the work you've been doing at Coastal Impact and with other projects so thank you for having me and yeah I'm going to share my screen now um, and tell you a bit more about the work that I've been doing as a wildlife filmmaker. Great. Right. Can you see this all right? Yeah okay. it's good. So to begin with kind of the early days, I grew up in Goa, which is a great place to be if you are passionate about wildlife and conservation, because I had the ocean pretty much in my backyard. And over the last couple of years, I've been able to tell more stories about the oceans and that connection has been solidified. But I started with windsurfing and with scuba diving. And then eventually I realized that I was having all of these adventures, but communicating them in words was really difficult because, you know, um, you can't really explain the wonder of the natural world in just words and the visual medium is really powerful. So that's when I got into wildlife filmmaking, but right before that I ran a nonprofit that was working with women who are victims of domestic and sexual violence and survivors of attacks of sexual and domestic violence. And these women were inspirational ladies and we all went on different adventures all across the country from diving to, um, you know, into the pool and learning how to swim from hiking 
mountains in the Himalayas, from learning how to do different kinds of adventure sports. These women really proved that being outdoors can change your life. And also they came back kind of ambassadors of the wild and told their communities more about their experiences and became leaders in a sense. So that experience of uh, working with these incredible women and men taught me that the outdoors can be transformational. But I realized that, you know, through a nonprofit, you can only do so much. You can reach out to say 20 people or to maybe 100 people or 200 people in a year. But if I wanted to bring the wild closer home, I could do that through the medium of television and through the digital platforms that we work with today. So that's how I got into wildlife filmmaking. And this is what I've been doing for the last five years now. And every single day is an adventure, I have to say. One day you're in the mountains, one day you're deep in the mangroves, completely covered in mud. The next day you're in a bat cave. I actually see my friend Rajesh is on the call as well. And we'll be talking about one of the projects that we worked on together recently on bat conservation. And um, I would like to start off by you know, telling you about the four main themes of my work. So the first is the human side of it. And as a wildlife filmmaker growing up in this generation, I realized that a lot of television that I was watching was often focused on the wildlife only. So if you watch the BBC or Discovery or National Geographic, you would see animals in combat or animals mating or animals in the wild doing different kinds of really cool natural history things. But um, very rarely did you actually see a human on screen and very rarely did you see um, the stories of the communities being represented on television globally. So I definitely came into wildlife filmmaking with uh, the maqsad of, you know, trying to understand exactly what it is um, to be a community living alongside wildlife and to kind of, you know, go in there and speak to these communities and understand what both the challenges are and the positives are of living with wildlife. And um, these are really complex issues and they span everything from wildlife trafficking to communities who live alongside wildlife and defend them every single day. But for me, um, you know, telling these stories is really important because I think that we do live in a world where we are having a significant impact on our planet. And if we don't accept um, the fact that we are and we don't dive into both the positive solutions and the negative effects that we're having, we cannot change things for the better. This picture that you see right here is of these incredible kids who are from the Moghia tribe in uh, Rajasthan. And these children are all the, the kids of poachers. Their dads have killed tigers many, many times over. Um, many of their dads are behind bars as well. But these children are being given a second chance at life by getting an education. And it's incredible to see how in the span of one generation, pretty much, you can see communities that have, you know, exploited the natural resources they live alongside, suddenly becoming educators and protectors. So I think we all have it in us. And as a storyteller, my responsibility is to document these positive stories. Secondly, it is documenting the lesser known. India is one of the most amazing countries when it comes to wildlife, but so often we only talk about the terrestrial wildlife, like say tigers or leopards or other kinds of species, but India also has so much more that we don't often understand and we don't often dive into in terms of uh, the, the media that we consume. So for the last couple of years, I've been working on projects that focus on very small species, like the purple frog, which isn't the best looking frog, um, to even larger species like the elephant, but um, kind of focusing a lot besides the charismatic megafauna on the animals that we don't often pay attention to. Because yes, while the tiger has this beautiful umbrella that we can protect other animals under, if we don't pay attention to habitats and to species that are undervalued, we will not be able to protect them both from a community perspective and from a policy perspective. Also, one of the other themes of my work is investigating wildlife crime. And that's something that I've been fascinated with ever since I got into this profession of being a wildlife filmmaker, because I think, you know, it, it's hard to document this issue because you have both the wildlife on one side and then you have the communities on the other. And so it is tricky to say, you know, who's on the right side very often. But over the last couple of years, I've been trying to document both perspectives of both the communities and the scientists and the, you know, marine biologists who are working to protect these incredible animals. This picture that you see right here is uh, a whale shark that I saw when I was in Guangzhou, China, a couple of years back. And this animal was killed for the wildlife trade, as were all of those um, sharks right behind. And I know um, there might be quite a few divers today. So if you just look at the number of sharks that these fins in this picture only represent, you have an understanding of what the scale of the wildlife trade is. 
Because when you walk into these stores in, you know, mainland China and Hong Kong, you see thousands and thousands of, you know, different kinds of species from sharks to tigers to ivory, even though there have been certain restrictions that the Chinese government has imposed recently. Um, and all of these animals are coming from different parts of the world. But what actually struck me was that a lot of them are coming from India and India is losing its biodiversity as a result of the wildlife trade. And I think that, you know, in a post pandemic world, in a world after 2020, we're all beginning to think more about the impact of the wildlife trade on people's health and on global public health. And as we begin to have these conversations, I think it's really important to dive into understanding what kind of enforcement strategies are required and what kind of policy changes are required to protect animals like this whale shark and lots more from different parts of the world. And finally, um, documenting conservation solutions. Because I am in the industry where I tell a lot of stories about con conservation and about the human wildlife interface, sometimes it can be a little bit depressing, honestly. You have stories of communities um, where members of their family have been killed by tigers. You have people who have you know, gone out there and killed different kinds of animals for the wildlife trade. But there are also these incredible stories that give me so much hope. And uh, that's what I've been choosing to focus on as well, because I think that when we shine a light on these issues and when we amplify these stories to broader communities, we realize that there is a lot that's worth fighting for. And there's a lot that we have that, you know, we should try to protect because sometimes it does feel like it's a gloom and doom situation. But the one thing that I've learned about the natural world is that it is resilient. It will bounce back when you give it a chance, when you give it the space and the protection that it requires. So there are lots of uh, reasons for hope. And this picture right here was a picture that a friend of mine took actually while we were in South Africa. And the reason the rhino has a bit of uh, that purple dye on its um, horn is because this rhino's horn was cut off as a result of the poaching crisis. But this rhino's horn was not cut off by a poacher, but by a conservationist. And the reason they did this was because they didn't want, you know, poachers to come in. So by cutting off the rhino's horn, you basically make this animal so much less valuable for any poacher that might be coming inside this park in South Africa where we took this picture. And I think, you know, with issues like this, it's always difficult because we are reminded of the impact humans are having. And while all of the conservation solutions aren't as intrusive as this, and a lot of them actually focus on habitat protection, that's one of the things that I've committed to in my career and in the work that me and my team do, um, which is documenting those positive stories that are out there. Um, so I'd like to show you a couple of videos. Um, one of the shows that I recently did, but well not recently, about a year and a half or two years back, was called On the Brink, and it focused on India's lesser known species. And it was really cool to work on that because it was one of the first times actually that you had an Indian crew making programs for an Indian audience. I mean, you don't have outsiders always coming in and telling us about our own wildlife. So we endeavored and we managed to tell stories about eight different species across India, everything from the great Indian buster to the slender loris, to the tiger, to the red panda, and pretty much in almost every single kind of habitat from the Himalayas to the Western Ghats. And this series played on television and was watched by millions of people all across. But I think that, you know, one thing that really struck me was the fact that there was so much wildlife in every single place that we looked in. And this episode that I'm just going to show you a clip of was actually from Bangalore, where we filmed the slender loris and we saw populations of slender lorises in a very crowded human dominated landscape, pretty much right where there's traffic. Um, you see cars whizzing by, you can hear the cars and let me play the clip. Those eyes are so mesmerizing. It's hard to look away. Loris has evolved much before monkeys. They became nocturnal as a clever strategy to avoid competition for food and space. To adapt to the night, their eyes have a reflective layer in the back that gives them excellent night vision. We're filming with infrared light so the animals won't be disturbed and we can witness their natural behavior. Harsh light can temporarily blind slender lorises. The only drawback with infrared is the inability to see a range of colors. This is the Mysore gray slender loris, found only in the Eastern Ghats in India. Lorises constantly groom themselves. 
Their second toenail is called the toilet claw, and it's assumed that this has been designed for cleaning. I'm a bit overwhelmed by what I'm seeing right now. I can hear the city sounds in the distance. This just goes to show that the natural world is not out there, living in isolation and distinct from us. It's right here, in our backyards. Um, I'm just having a bit of a tech issue, but the next series that I worked on was focused on big cats, but there's obviously, when I was starting out, a lot of people told me there have been a lot of big cat films made. Why do you want to make another one? Um, what can you add to it that is different? And I realized that in a lot of the narrative that we see in the media, we paint the communities that live alongside big cats as the enemies of conservation. When we open up newspapers and say Bombay, you hear uh, leopards coming to human dominated landscapes. You hear of people being mauled by animals. You hear of animals being killed. And that can create the perception that these animals do not live alongside humans and cannot live alongside humans. And very often the communities are villainized. So with my series Nat on Natural Wild, Living with Predators, one of the things that my team and I really wanted to do was to change that perception and to help people understand that it's not just the communities on the front lines who hate them. It's actually the fact that these communities really, really respect and protect these animals on a daily basis pretty much. And it's you know a range of different factors from economic factors, the fact that you know, big cats bring in a lot of tourism revenue into these places to the fact that, you know, in India, we have this spiritual reverence for different kinds of wildlife species. And that kind of trickles down, trickle down in, into conservation. And I think with the series, we really realized that, you know, there were different kinds of communities from the Hibari to the Maldhari to the Mogya, three different tribes, pretty much. And every single one of them had this insane respect for the natural world that resulted in them protecting Asiatic lions, leopards, and tigers. And this series is now playing in different parts of the world right now. But for me, the best part of it was when the show played in Gujarat and a couple of the people who were actually in the documentary um, gave me a call. They were super excited and they said to us that, you know, hey, we watched the show and uh, I don't think that I've ever seen a show that actually tells our story, the story of the people who live alongside lions. We've seen stories about our lions, but to hear, you know, the voices of ourselves and of our brothers and our friends in the community really, really made us feel like we are also a part of this ecosystem. And that's what I endeavor to do with my films. Here's the trailer if you haven't seen it. Those eyes. Big cats, the most feared members of the animal kingdom. Struggling to find space in modern India. As the city expands rapidly into some of our last remaining wild species, humans and big cats are being forced to confront one another. But in some pockets, people are learning to live with big cats. But what is the secret behind this coexistence? To find out, I'm embarking on the journey of a lifetime. This forest is where the natural world meets the historical world. Getting up close with these incredible predators. She's literally five strides away from me right now. I'm meeting the communities and rangers on the front lines. Mobile technology plays such a big role in the fight against wildlife trafficking. To understand what it's really like to have big cats as a neighbor. It's super tense right now. If we keep the tiger's neighbors happy, the tiger is happy. This is the story of coexistence, like never seen before. I'm Malaika, I'm looking for the extraordinary relationship that some communities share with big cats in India. And as part of this series, we also documented the stories of these village wildlife volunteers. As you know, the population of tigers in Ranthavo is quite high. So you see a lot of tigers dispersing outside of the national park. And when these animals disperse, they basically go into places where a lot of communities live in villages. And as a result, it's really difficult for the forest department to actually have, you know, DFOs and RFOs and you know field staff actually positioned all across because they cannot monitor um, the different tigers that are moving all of you know on the outskirts of the national park. So this organization that I really really admire called Tiger Watch 
has figured out a system where they've got community members employed as volunteers of the forest. And these guys, these amazing men that you see here, set up camera traps, they monitor any tra trafficking. They, if there's any you know, lead that they find out about um, someone having weapons that they would be using to say kill a tiger for the international trade in tiger parts, they will immediately alert the forest department. They will gather that intelligence and then use that to protect the wildlife in their backyard. And through them, they also create a bit of awareness in the communities where they talk to other people and they help them to, you know, understand that, you know, these animals are just passing through. It is not a cause for alarm. It is not something that you should, you know, respond to with violence, but just let these tigers go through and the probability is that nothing will actually happen. And then one of the projects that I've been working on for the longest time now that we just wrapped up in 2020 is a project that focuses on the trade in manta rays. Now, manta rays are one of the most, you know, charismatic animals underwater. And I'm sure that people who've dived with them will relate to me when I say that, you know, they connect with humans. They'll come close to you and they will interact with you and they have this, you know, sentience and intelligence about them. But they also have become one of the biggest products that has emerged inside of wildlife markets all across Asia. And manta rays actually get uh, killed for their gills, which are then harvested and then used in soups in, in uh, mainland China, especially. And the problem with this is not only is it bad for the anim animals, obviously, as you can see in this picture, but it's also bad from a human health perspective because these animals bioaccumulate as they move up, move through the oceans. And when humans consume that, you have all of these heavy leads like um, uh, cadmium and metal and arsenic that is inside of these gills. So it's really bad from a human health perspective as well. But we've been working on a campaign along with the Wildlife Trust of India to um, research the trade in these manta rays, figure out exactly what species we're finding in India, and then use that research along with the documentary as tools to get policy change to protect them in our country's waters. Because right now, manta rays do not receive any protection under the Indian law. Yes, they are protected by CITES, but they haven't been protected by the Wildlife Protection Act. So that's one of the things that I've been working on um, over the last couple of years. And this film will be out in 2021. And I think, you know, when it comes to wildlife uh, trafficking, especially, one of the things that I often get asked is, uh, well, what about the people who depend on this? You know, what about the, the children of those families? And what about the fishermen? And I think that, you know, it is up to us as conservationists and as storytellers and as ideators of all of these conservation projects to figure out ways to provide these communities with an alternative form of income and to provide them with opportunities to, you know, just fully um, live in their environment, be able to provide for their families without depending on the forest or without depending on the ocean in an extractive way. And you see these kids over here who are playing with shark fins and manta rays. And I think that, you know, if we don't stop this trade in the next five to 10 years, um, it's going to be bad both from a wildlife perspective and from a community perspective because these animals will run out anyway. Their, their populations are um, really, really unstable because they are slow breeding animals. So it is important to protect them while we still can. And uh, hopefully we can protect them so that these kids can one day see a manta ray in the ocean in their own backyard. And finally, one of the projects that I've been recently working on has focused on bat conservation. This is the Kolar leaf nose bat. And what is incredible about it is that it is a really, really unique bat that you find only in one place in India, which is in the Kolar region, where you see them in these amazing bat caves. And the story that we did with Al Jazeera was focused on why we need to protect habitat. I think that, you know, in the aftermath of the pandemic, there's been a lot of killings of bats all across the world because people just assume that if you have a bat in your vicinity, that bat has the virus and it can infect you and your family, and therefore it must be exterminated. But these bats bring so many ecosystem services and the odds of you actually getting the virus from a bat that you come close to are pretty much zero to none, right? So I think it's important to protect these animals because not only are they important from an ecosystem's perspective and from an economic perspective in terms of the agricultural, agricultural sector, but they're also important in terms of the fact that they are incredibly amazing animals and they are a part of this ecosystem along with other species. And as humans, we are kind of stewards of this planet. So it is our responsibility to make sure that these animals exist for future generations. So the story that we did for Al Jazeera kind of focused on this place where one of the most newly protected areas has come about as a result of this tiny bat. 
And when I first heard about the story, um, what I found most fascinating was the fact that this conservation reserve was pretty much created not for a tiger or a leopard or a big charismatic animal like an elephant, but for a small species like a bat. And um, this bat actually, you can see quite a few of them inside of the cave. So I met with two researchers, Rajesh Pichiswamaya and Rohit Chakravarti. And both of them are incredibly dedicated. They were, you know, inside of these caves, researching the bats, setting up uh, different kinds of equipment to understand these animals better from a scientific perspective, and also working to conserve them in terms of protecting their habitat and the habitat of other bats across the country. So here's a tiny clip about some of the adventures that we have as wildlife filmmakers and wildlife presenters when we get to go and shadow scientists. I'm pretty sure there are no claustrophobic bat scientists. <laughs> that was right next to my face. So cool. They're getting quite active right now, aren't they? You know, when I put these earphones on, I can hear these bat vocalizations that sound almost alien. But as soon as I take them off, I can hear the sounds of the communities who live nearby, of the farmers who live alongside bats. I mean, if there's any evidence of the fact that bats and humans can coexist together seamlessly, this soundscape is exactly that. I've never heard something like this before. And uh, one of the most recent projects that I worked on in the last couple of months of 2020 focused on elephants. And the reason I'm standing right next to these elephants is not because um, I'm a daredevil, which I wouldn't do in the wild, but because these elephants are actually rescued from illegal um, centers where they were kept as tourism elephants. So um, the film focuses on the elephant tourism sector and how that is really exploitative because when you see an elephant in captivity, so many of us have, and we've, you know, become so normalized to it. It's become a very, you know, something that we just don't think about twice pretty much. But these animals are often trafficked as young calves from the wild, separated from their mothers and their herd, and taken into captivity where they are often, you know, they have to go through this very brutal training process so that humans can ride them. But um, we wanted to focus also on the positive solutions out there. So I went and I met with the team at Wildlife SOS. And what they've been doing is rescuing these elephants and keeping them inside of this beautiful, beautiful rescue center where they can walk around. They have lots of space. They get to interact with other elephants for the first time ever. And that's especially important because, you know, every single one of these elephants was taken away from the wild at a really young age. And pretty much for 50 years of their life or 20 years of their life, they have to spend their entire lives in captivity all alone. And elephants are social animals, just like us. They like to be around, about, around members of their own kind. And when you keep an elephant away from their own kind, keep them in captivity, shackled up, um, it not only is bad for them from a physical perspective, but also from a psychological perspective, because they are you know, very, very intelligent animals. So that's what the film focuses on. And um, as part of the filming process, we did a bit of an investigation into the elephant trade in Jaipur, which is one of the epicenters of elephant tourism. So you have hundreds of thousands of people visiting every single year and riding these elephants. But I do think that, you know, we can create a difference where, you know, by awareness, because this is a trade that can be stopped if consumers like you and me say, you know, no to elephant rides, we can actually create a world where elephants can remain wild and not have this additional pressure of elephant tourism besides the developmental pressures and despite the fact that so much of the habitat has been slashed in the last couple of decades in India and across the world. So here's a tiny clip from my investigation in Jaipur. You know, early in the week, I was in the forest surrounded by wild elephants. And I can promise you that if I was on foot off my Jeep and in this close proximity to a wild elephant, I would have been crushed within seconds. And what people don't realize is that for you to get this close to an animal as powerful as an elephant, for you to take pictures with it and bathe it and ride it, there's a backstory there. A backstory of the animal being exposed to fear-based training that crushes their spirit and takes away all of their wildness, making them docile and tame enough to be around humans. That's what you're paying for when you choose to be around captive elephants.
we hope that in the coming years to go, we can create enough of an awareness campaign about this issue that people actually go out there and they seek out, you know, real experiences with wild animals. I mean, people often talk about the uh, wildlife trade aspect of it, which is, you know, very easy to talk about because we can always just push it off to China. But so many of us have facilitated elephant tourism and tiger tourism. I have, I've ridden an elephant when I was younger. And of course, I feel guilty about it, but I feel like, you know, that just gives us this additional responsibility to make other people aware of this so that in the years to come, we can create a better future for not just elephants, but tigers and primates that get taken into captivity from the wild. And finally, I'm ending with a picture of me in uh, Zemitang, which is a place near Zemitang in Arunachal Pradesh. And uh, I was, uh, it's a funny story. I was walking through the snow and in like a couple of seconds, the snow just buckled under my feet and I fell through into this icy cold water, which I had to like lug myself out of. And I was completely inside of this cold, cold water in the middle of nowhere. And the cameras were like turned the other way at the time. So no one even documented that moment. But um, despite some of the conservation problems that I often you know, encounter at work, I think that wildlife presenting and wildlife filmmaking is an adventure every single day, whether you're going undercover and trying to understand more about elephant trafficking in Jaipur, or whether you're trying to you know, uh, film red pandas, which is what we were doing in this part of the world. Um, it's always an adventure and every single day teaches me something new about India's wildlife and you know being a, a wildlife filmmaker in India there's nothing quite like it because we have the most incredible biodiversity and therefore we have an extra important you know responsibility to protect this for future generations so thank you and I'd love to hear any questions and open up the discussion thank you Malaika that was awesome I think especially for me, your passion comes through. And that is the most important thing that is required in anybody who is trying to pass on a message of uh, anything as profound as conservation and uh, people. In fact, this is a topic which is actually not very well presented most of the time. As you said, we concentrate mostly on wildlife, neglecting or forgetting the human angle to it. And uh, that was really good. I, I'm deeply distressed to say that I haven't seen any of your films right now. I'm admitting to it. I'll send you the links. They're online as well. Sometimes. I would love to watch them. I would love to watch them. And uh, particularly because you are in them, right? Because, you no, know, like you said, it's um, very rare, number one, to see an Indian made documentary. And number two, to have a young female presenter in that as well, who comes across with the passion. So definitely would look that. I'm sure everybody who's attending this webinar also would love to see that. So I will pass on the links that you send me to all of them. Most of them are on my uh, Coastal Impact WhatsApp group. So I will share that. Um, You'll have a much wider audience. But I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very strong medium that you're looking at. And you have realized that at a very young age, uh, how powerful this medium can be. And this is what is the need of the hour. Right now, more, I got into this game very, very late, unfortunately. But again, it was passion which prompted me to set up Coastal Impact and do something about the coral in Goa, which nobody even knew about. And uh, I think what you're doing is amazing and that you started so young and you managed to keep the passion going and you're concentrating on species which are not keystone species, but which are, as you said, lesser known. And it's so important that they make the base of the food chain. And that is what everything else depends on. And that's fantastic. Right now, my first question to you. Thank you so much. Not yes. at all. <laughs> my first question to you is very, very important. And you really need to think about how you can answer this because nobody else has the answer, right? <laughs> how many days are there in a year and how many hours are they in a day because you seem to have more than our share <laughs> so tell me what's the secret <laughs> well i think that you know with uh, the wildlife trade and with conservation issues we honestly don't have that much time i think that's what fuels me the sense of urgency because maybe if i was born 50 years back or 70 years back i would have 
made one film a year, made mm. you know lesser <laughs> films, but I think that right now we are living in the extinction crisis, and people all yeah. across the world have to understand and reckon with that future that we have ahead of us. And I think that if we do act right now, we if I'm not fully optimistic that we can get stuff back to normal like it was say 20 years back, but at least we can protect what we have right now and conserve the remaining habitat and the remaining species. So honestly, that's where my sense of urgency comes from. But the second thing is that I have so much fun doing it. Like I don't need to go on vacation very often. I still do, but I don't have to because going out there and being in these different landscapes and going and having different adventures every single day gives you a sense of purpose as well. But it's also really, really fun. I have a great time on every single shoot. So the reason I make uh, films and the reason I feel like I try to pack as much as I can in a year is because I love doing it and I can't imagine not doing this. Fantastic. I think you're really lucky because you found your calling in life very early. And that's a lot, what a lot of us do not dis, uh, you know, discover until very late, sadly. But that's great. I'm really glad you got that and uh, you're making a hell of a difference, that's for sure by educating everybody. It's one of the best gifts you can give to anyone. So come on guys, the floor is open. I'm not seeing questions coming up here. Here we go. Uh, Venkat, there's one question on the chat window from yes. Pam D'Souza. It says, hi Malaika, lovely to see someone so young having taken the trouble to do South Asian wildlife filming. What kind of viewership have your wildlife documentaries reached? Just trying to gauge how far the message is being spread because there is nothing like the visual medium to get these stories across. That's a good question. I think, you know, I definitely come from the school of thought that if you're making really powerful films, but it's only your friends and family that are watching it, then you're not doing enough. And with my first couple of films, like my first film on Tigers, it was just my friends and family. But in the last couple of years, my films have been playing on National Geographic and Discovery and Animal Planet and now Al Jazeera and other networks. And the benefit of that is that it gives you this global audience that you can reach out to. So with the series that I talked about, about Big Cats, that's been playing in the last couple of months across 91 countries, reaching out to millions of people. But more importantly, it's reaching out to the communities as well, because it's being dubbed into, say, Hindi and Marathi and um, other South Indian languages as well. So that makes sure that the audience isn't just wide, but it's also diverse. And that's something that I deeply care about, about making these films accessible to communities that are not so um, privileged often and sometimes don't, don't have the access to those resources to understand more about conservation. And I think, you know, conservation definitely has a, this heritage of, being you know inside circles that are often you know just very privileged circles and it is our responsibility as storytellers to get this out into wider circles and of course i haven't figured it out yet we're still struggling with getting it outside of television networks you know i think different kinds of apps that are used in rural parts of the country are a great way to reach out to people and maybe in the coming years i will figure out ways to get them out to even larger audiences but right now it's primarily been through television through the different networks i work with and then also the networks collaborate with um, or online organizations or they partner or have sister entities like for example matt while has programs on television but it also does go on to disney plus and then hotstar so you definitely have a larger audience that is consuming this not only on television screens but also on their smartphones at home that's brilliant. I think that's that's what we need in this country, particularly. It should not be limited to just English speaking audiences. It has to filter down to the grassroots level. Great. Apoorv has got a question. Can you share your experience with the impact your documentaries have made at policy level decision making in India? I don't think they made an impact at policy level. I have to be honest with myself. I'm trying to. Um, first of all, I think, you know, the documentaries that I focused on on biodiversity conservation so far, they aren't aimed at policy change because those are aimed at just getting people to appreciate the kind of wildlife and biodiversity that we have to begin with. I think that when you put a spotlight on spaces that haven't been documented before in a large way, you can create that kind of attention that gets policymakers to take those landscapes more seriously, if you know what I mean, where they begin to see these landscapes as important to protect from a policy perspective. But the one film that I am making right now, which is focused on policy protection, we finished the film, we finished the research part of it, and we're actually drafting the policy recommendation as we speak. So that's in the pipeline, and it's been exciting working with the team at the Wildlife Trust of India and my colleague Sajan on this. But um, hopefully we can create a bit of a change for these animals. Um, 
policy change, unlike making a documentary, takes a lot longer. It takes a deliberate, constant effort. So I feel like for filmmakers, you can't commit to making a policy change with every single one of your documentaries. But if there are certain issues that are really close to your heart and issues that you really care about, I think we have a responsibility to go beyond you know, the streaming date of the film or beyond the telecast date and actually follow it through with the campaign or with the educational initiative or with the policy research initiative or something that can actually create tangible change at the grassroots and at the national level. Excellent. Okay, one more question from an anonymous attendee is, hi Malaika, I've been a fan since I've watched Living With Predators. What advice would you give to younger viewers like myself who want to pursue the same career? And what sort of challenges did you encounter as such a young woman in the field? So um, I often get asked this question, but you know, it's been incredible because let me just plug in my computer. I think it might die any second. So what do you do when you're a wildlife filmmaker? You're not always ready and you're kind of being very good at jugad as you go. But uh, the thing is that, you know, with being a wildlife filmmaker, people often talk about how it is being a female wildlife filmmaker presenter and filmmaker, but I de definitely have to say that it is no different. And I've been really lucky because this industry is one of the most welcoming, in my opinion, in my personal experience, I have to say, where people don't really think about your gender so much when they you know, look at who they want to hire. And um, over the last couple of years, I've worked with teams that are fully women and I've worked with teams that have different genders. And I've worked with only men for the most part of you know, different filming projects. But I feel like if you have the skill set and the passion and an ability to really dive into the story and have this you know, storytelling capacity to um, reach out to wider audiences, people will take you seriously. So for me, it's been really, really inviting and really, really welcoming. And I have to say that's because of the work that other wildlife filmmakers who are women have done before me. They've set the stage for young women like myself to come over and to ensure that they can do exactly what men did 50 years back. So it is an inviting place. And if you, you know, want to be a wildlife filmmaker, people are here to support you throughout. I would say that being younger has been a bit challenging. That's something that is difficult sometimes because people, when they watch television, and they're so used to seeing David Attenborough presenting about the natural world and talking about wildlife. And he's like 93 or something right now. But he also started at 20, in his 20s or 30s. But people often just associate um, age with wisdom and they want to have someone more authoritative and older on television. So initially, when I started with wildlife presenting and filmmaking, it was a bit hard to convince commissioners to take a bet on someone who was 20 or 19 or 21. But over time, I realized that being younger allows me to reach out to an audience that is my age, to reach out to my generation and to tell them stories in a way that is relatable. When I'm on camera so often, I'm being myself, I'm you know, being silly on camera and being sad on camera when I come across something, but I don't try to be someone who I'm not. And I think that that's one of the most important things to being a wildlife presenter where you're just authentic really. And you just pretend to be, you know, you don't pretend to be anyone, you just, you just are yourself. Um, and to, then from a wildlife filmmaking perspective, I would say that if you are interested in being in this space, definitely just start somewhere. Like if you have a phone camera or a small DSLR camera at home, start out by going and recording things in your backyard, recording biodiversity. If you have friends who also do this and who have different skill sets as yours, um, you can collaborate with them and create your first project. But I feel like there's a lot of opportunity in this industry. You just have to have the passion to go all the way and to keep you know persisting despite all of the challenges that are out there and we need more wildlife filmmakers because there is so much biodiversity in this country and so many conservation challenges that haven't been documented so come on board and i think now malaika is getting old so we need younger <laughs> people in the picture right <laughs> <laughs> and if you ever have any credibility problem you come to me i'll lend you some of my hair <laughs> So you'll get better credibility with my head. Okay. <laughs> okay, folks, any more questions? Come on, keep them coming. Don't give her time to breathe. We did have a request for links for your uh, films. Oh, if you so. could let me have them and maybe I can circulate them. Yeah, for sure. I will send across the links. I actually have one right here that I'm going to send. The one that I've posted in the chat is of the television series that we did on Asiatic lions, leopards, and tigers. It's on Disney Plus and Hotstar, so you can check it out there. And I think it's playing on TV as well right now. Thank you. I think Karen has got a question about rhinos. I'll let her ask. 
No. <laughs> no, no, it's serious. It, it's something which I never thought about, which you should. No, no. Um, yeah, we were learning that uh, rhino's horn is actually made up of compacted hair. And in your video, you said that the conservationist had actually chopped off the, uh, the rhino's horn to make him less valuable to the, the hunters and the poachers. So is that, that presumably that horn grows back then? Because hair grows back, doesn't it? So it must be like an ongoing thing? It is. So what they do is every couple of months, I think about six or eight months, they have to do this again because the horn does grow back. But within that six month period, they pretty much have that protection against wildlife poachers. Um, it's obviously a very harrowing process for the rhino because you have these um, helicopters. I remember seeing it live. You have these helicopters last July in South Africa that just kind of circle and then these animals are darted and tranquilized. And uh, as soon as they go down, they these amazing vets and these amazing conservationists go in there and they saw off the rhino's horn and that happens within a span of about 10 minutes, less than that actually. And then the rhino, you know, comes back and he starts running around and he goes away. And obviously I think that's, you know, not the best case scenario. Hopefully we can create a world where not just in South Africa, but also in our country and Kaziranga and other parts where we don't have to resort to these extreme measures to protect wildlife, but we can actually protect it in, in other ways by, you know, con conserving habitat, providing economic opportunities to the poaching communities and figuring out ways to enforce more laws when it comes to the wildlife trade. Thank you. Okay, one more question from Niti. Thank you so much for your passion. Also your encouragement with your last answer. Can you please share some resources, links for enthusiasts like myself who can get into the field as well? So I wouldn't say there's any resource that I can actually point you to because everyone's journey is completely different. I've met so many wildlife filmmakers. Some of them were ex-techies. Some of them are engineers, um, people who are writers and then got into wildlife filmmaking. And I think that, you know, different people have different skill sets. I know someone who, you know, is an engineer and therefore can build really good camera contraptions when he's shooting. I know another friend who's a brilliant writer and therefore she's much better at writing scripts. So I think that, you know, whatever your current skill set is, I feel like you can find a way to channel that into wildlife filmmaking because we have script writers and directors and producers and presenters. And I personally write scripts, I direct, I produce, and I also present. And I feel like when I started off, I thought that I, can, I would be a wildlife camera woman and that I'd be behind the camera. And I realized that I wasn't very good at the technical aspect of camera work. I still do it, but it's not something that I can you know, fully dive into and do as my only thing. Um, but I realized that there is a space for other aspects of the wildlife production set up. And that's why I write and I present and produce and direct because I feel like that allows me to be part of the storytelling process. And that's what I really love. So I don't think there's any like specific resource that I could point you to. But what I would say is that when I first started out, it was difficult to actually get the funding to make your first film. It's hard um, before you get you know, commissioners on board. And what really helped me was becoming a National Geographic Explorer because they trusted me with a project that I really wanted to do. And they gave me that initial amount of you know, grant funding that allowed me to make a, a three-part series on wildlife. And I think that you know, if there are young people who are tuning in and if you are interested in wildlife filmmaking, um, the Nat Geo grants that are on their website are a really good place to go and have a look because I think that that first film is always what starts you out and then you just keep building on it and improving and making better films that can create more of an impact. Great, okay, Fam has got a question. What kind of research do you have to do to get your stories? Because it isn't only reading, it is getting into animals and people's lives. Are there more Goan stories that you would like to explore? So I've been, uh, let me answer the first part of the question first. Um, when it comes to the research process, I actually started being a wildlife researcher at a production house in Bangor called Fellas Creations. And I learned so much about wildlife filmmaking by just being behind the scenes, uh, doing the background research, reading up about wildlife, speaking to scientists. And I think that that's something that I still carry with me with every single project, because you need to do like maybe sometimes two months of research before you can go into the field for 15 days, because you need to understand not just the wildlife behavior, because on camera, 
I don't have a script. Everything is pretty much impromptu. Sometimes I write out lines that I'd like to say, but for the most part, it is spontaneous. So when you have a tiger right behind you, you don't have a chance to look at your script. You have to just remember stuff in the top of your head and just think about things that can make the story more interesting. So for me, as a wildlife presenter, research is what I spend a lot of my time doing, whether that's reading or reading research papers or watching other documentaries or speaking to scientists and speaking to experts in the field. Um, the research process is, I mean, pivotal to the wildlife filmmaking process. Um, but then also when it comes to wildlife film with natural history and with filming animals, you can't find everything online. So you sometimes have to go to a recce. You have to meet people who are locals from the communities around there or scientists and try to understand the behavior of this animal so that you can predict its movements, so that you can predict how they would respond in different situations. And what I often do is I start out by reading a lot. And then if I have questions, I reach out to resource people and to experts in the field. So that helps me to create a much better picture. And then once you go into the field, you pretty much have to wing it. I mean, you have to realize that you have all of this you know, information, but the story is right there. It is unfolding in front of you. So you can't script it very often. You have to you know, listen to the communities. If you hear about a tiger attack in one village, you have to go there, even though you might have planned to film right or, you know, in this particular village that day. And you have to try to figure out how you can use your film to create a difference. Because very often we just make films because we think that, you know, this is an important issue and that's from our brains and our brains have biases, of course. But if you can kind of, you know, speak to people around that community and you can speak to experts and understand what's the issue here and then work backwards pretty much to do a better job with communicating that on screen as a, a filmmaker, I think that's when you can actually do a much better job of communicating your research into a way that is really applicable in a real world context. And then the second part of your question, which is about Goa, I have been the worst going here because most of my films focus on other parts of the country and other parts of the world. I recently made one documentary with Nat Geo Traveler, a short film of a couple of minutes, which was focused on Goa's biodiversity. But I think that there's so much in the state and in the coming years, hopefully I get an opportunity to document it some more, especially because of the threats that this wildlife faces today. Don't forget the underwater part. Yes, of course. I think that's, that's where we're going to work together. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it is to me, it is very sad that even the scientists from organizations like NIO have neglected their own backyard because at the drop of a hat, everybody's rushing off to Lakshadweep or Andamans. No doubt they are fabulous places and they have got huge amount of biodiversity underwater, but Goa has got its own share which I always say when I'm doing presentations in schools, et cetera, to students that, you know, Goans, unfortunately, know the only fish that is, ends up on their plates. They don't know the biodiversity that is there underwater. And it's a lot. Everybody focuses on murky waters, but there's a lot to see underwater and you can actually, and you experienced it. So and it's also an appeal to the wild in Goa because I feel like when you go diving in the Maldives, there's so many tourists there and you just, um, it's very predictable, but I've had dives in Goa where I've seen things that I didn't expect, right? Mm -hmm. but there's, you know, it's always an adventure whether you're diving in, you know, one particular dive site or whether you're walking in the forest in Goa, there's so much that you don't expect that just can surprise you. That's correct. Yeah. Every day is a new experience, as you said correctly. I've got Anita on, uh, who's a marine biologist with NIO. So she's saying I'm already in Venkat for Goa. <laughs> okay, so, and she's wishing you all the best. All right. Oh, thank you. All right, folks. Anything else? I think Malaika is getting hungry again. She had a bite <laughs> before we started, but I think she's talked out now. <laughs> so if anybody's got a question, please do go ahead and ask. Otherwise, we will wrap this up. And uh, we look forward to Malaika giving us all the links to all her movies so we can have a fun time settling down with Fanny and Chips and watch that. <laughs> I think everybody's hungry. They're heading off to dinner. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Malaika. Thank you for a fabulous and very informative talk. And uh, it was really nice to see all the different things that you've done. It's not one dimensional, if you know what I mean. And uh, uh, look for, if there is one thing I can pin you down to, what is the thing that you 
really, really, really want to film in the future or make a documentary on. Now that you've seen a lot of the other stuff, but there must be something which you're extra passionate about. Well, I really want to go diving in the Galapagos and film some wildlife there. I think um, it is incredible. And just out of personal reason, I just think that I would have the most amazing time. And also, um, it is where Darwin wrote so much of you know his seminal work. So I've always been inspired by that. And one of the things I definitely want to film is an adventure series, diving in different parts with sharks. So mm -hmm. yeah, Galapagos and maybe different other parts of Asia as well. Um, that's on my radar for sure. Okay, I've got a seriously bad back, but I am now volunteering to carry your suitcase <laughs> and accompany you on all these trips, <laughs> because for me, that is an awesome project that you're looking at. <laughs> so we do have a company called Scuba Centric, which does travel abroad for diving. And we are looking at organizing a trip either to Malpelo or to Galapagos. Okay. So I will definitely include you in that list for sure. And we'll have a blast. Sounds All right. OK, thank you so much for being on the trip. Hang on, there's one more question here. Uh, uh, Fam just says, thank you for all the organizing and best wishes, Malaika. I look forward to seeing your present and future work. So proud to hear of a fellow Goan who has taken such an adventurous path. So thank you, Fam, and I'm sure uh, Malaika has inspired you enough to actually get out there and also make films on your own. And I look forward to inviting you back on this webinar as a presenter, not as a uh, viewer, right? I'm sure Malaika will join us for that one as well. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Yes, thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you.